guys, welcome to The Disruptors, the show where we get the interested folks, the interesting folks building the future. Today, we've got somebody who's doing that and helping a lot of other companies do that as well. Dan Fagella on the program. Dan, thanks for coming. Of course, Matt. Glad to be here. So Dan, you had a lot of success and decided to get into AI. Why? Yeah. Um, well, the, the trajectory into AI was actually from the cognitive sciences. So I, I went to University of Pennsylvania for grad school um, studying um, essentially skill acquisition. So how do people learn to learn faster? I'm a combat sports guy. You see my ears are all messed up here? All oh, yeah. What sports? Up. Yeah. So uh, I was... I was Brazilian Jiu Jitsu for a long time, national champion, did the black belt thing, seminars in the US and South America. Um, and uh, I was interested in essentially how to learn faster, which is a fascination for me. Um, so when I went to grad school at University of Pennsylvania, um, I heard rustles in the breeze, this is 2011, I heard rustles in the breeze about, hey, all that neuro stuff you're studying, you know they're doing that with machines now. And this is really early kind of still in academia where they're starting to get into ImageNet and training computers to identify pictures of butterflies and flowers and whatever. Um, and I basically got out of grad school feeling like, wow, uh, I, I might have studied the wrong thing uh, because I, I sort of got the sense that um, if, you know, if, if things that are sentient and conscious are, are what matters, um, then if, if this neurotech sort of extension stuff was kind of looking a little bit at um, the folks at BrainGate who are controlling robotic limbs with their arms. This stuff is going back since I think before 2010. Looking at that, looking at what's going on with AI, if, if we can expand sentience itself or eventually create sentience itself at some time within my lifetime, that would be so much more morally consequential than teaching people to learn faster. Um, there's only so much we can do with our current hardware software. Uh, and so it was Neuro uh, that essentially opened my eyes to the AI side and, and, and kind of convinced me pretty well that this is likely to be what the expansiveness of, of consciousness within my lifetime would be. And I might as well damn well focus on it um, and, and its consequences. Creating our, cr creating our masters. Uh, yeah, m more or less. I mean, framing it, however you want to frame it, create, you know, it's, it's masters. It's, uh, Are you worried? Pro it's prodigy. It's, oh yeah. I think there's a tremendous number of reasons to be worried. Sure. I mean, you know, worried day to day, like do I cower, you know, in, in the, in the shower and uh, cry tears? Uh, no. But, you know, worried as if like um, maybe sometimes I feel like it'd be maybe easier to die in a rocking chair at 87 like my grandparents than it would be to go out however I'm going to go out. Um, yeah, maybe sometimes. I think there's grand possibilities of the amazing and I think there's probably a good deal more grand possibilities of, of uh, um, at least for humanity, uh, kind of the, uh, the end. But um, exciting time to be alive no matter what. So um, that's, that's the way I frame it. Interesting. It sounds like for you, at least, we're approaching something that's bordering on inevitable. Um, yeah. So I don't want to come across like that too much with you, Matt. I mean, I'll give you this. Okay. This is as much as I've ever gone. I, I don't prognosticate and pretend, pretend that I'm not prognosticating. That's all I'm doing. I'm, I'm positing ideas. So my job is mapping the AI capability space of the implications, the applications today and then sort of layering that on top of where I think things are going. That's all I can do. So um, my only supposition is this. I'm maybe 60% positive. So this is not iron certainty. This is not faith here, Matt. Uh, I may be 60% positive that within my lifetime, we will come to get a, a sense uh, pretty firmly of what is after people, um, sort of uh, massively extended cognitively uh, human beings and or um, sort of grandly capable artificial intelligence. Maybe not AGI in a full-blown like deity sense, but steps in that direction that are firm enough to positively, uh, you know, determine the course of the trajectory of intelligence itself. That's that's the term. So that's sixty percent, Matt. I'm I'm not no no faith here. No faith here. What makes you say that? I know a lot of people are skeptical. Yeah. Um. You know, I. I uh, if I look at where, I mean, we can, we can posit a whole bunch of different elements of this here. So some of this could be my own intuition. I could say, Matt, well, by golly, you know, uh, I take a look at how much AI has progressed in the last, let's say, 10 years. Um, and I imagine what that would look like in the future. I could do the same with kind of neurotech and what's going on there. Um, a lot of it, honestly, is also just interviewing and talking to people. It's been something to the tune of six years. I mean, my first interview with Ben Gertzel was like, seven years ago or something. First interview with Bostrom was like six years ago or something. This is, nobody gave a crap about this stuff seven years ago, brother. Uh, so, um, 
you talk to a lot of these folks, and we've done big polls, polls of dozens of, of AI researchers, and basically just ask their perspective on multiple topics, such as what are the biggest AI risks, such as when might artificial intelligence become sentient, such as um, when might the singularity occur, whereby we, we really launch into kind of a foom of intelligence in whatever form that is, biological or AI or whatever the case may be. And we get a lot of kind of confluence in the 2060 range. Um, now, that could just be some weird statistical hoopla, and or it could be a self-selecting group of people who are um, open to even communicating about those things, and they might be hyper-optimists, but many of them aren't, to be honest with you, but, but maybe it biases more in that direction. So uh, when I give you my 60% sort of feeling there, some of it is intuitive based on progress, but a lot of it is actually based on polls. So if you're on emerj.com, which is our website, um, you can see these polls, and then you can read the word-for-word -word statements from uh, dozens of PhDs. Um, so a lot of it comes from them. I've seen some interesting stats about when you try to get expert opinions, and the expert opinions being no better than random Joes yeah, off the Yeah, random street. people. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, and I think that probably differs... Um, that probably differs field to field, right? So if you, if you got me a bunch of people off the street and I asked them to, I don't know, um, uh, make sense of some quote from Plutarch or Michelle de Montaigne, you know, they're probably going to do real bad. Or if you ask me to, you know, give them like some random image of like an organ of some bird, like some aviary organ that humans don't have and like identify it, like my guess is they're going to do real bad. Um, so, so the sort of like aggregate expertise thing, I think, um, has its place where uh, maybe the masses sort of win the game. And then I think it has its place where the, the masses actually don't win the game. Um, and I don't really know where AGI fits in there. My guess is uh, it's, it's uh, you know, it's maybe somewhere in between. Couldn't tell you. You brought up sentience. Are sentience yeah. and consciousness the same thing for you? And uh, if, we, if we solve one, do we solve the other? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think a lot of it's semantics. I, I, I often will use them in place of each other, uh, even though I think, you know, if I was uh, semantically perfect, maybe that wouldn't be the case. But I, I think about, you know, consciousness as um, something that has consciousness that might not be the right verb when we come to really understand it. But um, I think it's a screaming shame that we don't understand consciousness, like a, an absolute screaming shame. It's, it's uh, vile that, that we don't have a firmer understanding of consciousness. But um, something that has an internal movie, something that can feel, that can see, that can experience. Um, maybe it has a real nice wide pain pleasure gradient as we imagine many animals to, to have. M maybe it just has senses, you know, can detect light, can detect something, but it's, it's really not much more than that. Um, consciousness would be kind of any gradient of that internal movie, something playing, right? Something different than we might imagine this mug. Like I, I, just, I just don't think it thinks, I just don't think it feels, I just don't think it has many senses. Um, but, you know, we might imagine a cricket has a, a decent range there. Uh, we might imagine a, a moose has a little bit more, and we might imagine you have uh, slightly more than that. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I, consider, I consider them to, to sort of refer to the same point, which is things that are aware of themselves, which would seem to be the only things that could be morally relevant, more or less. And yet we haven't solved consciousness. You're, you, you brought it up that it's terrible that we haven't. Do you think we haven't because we haven't looked in the right places? Or do you think we haven't because we're not physically capable of comprehending what needs Could to be, be either. comprehended? Could be either. Um, well, so uh, I'm very firm on the stance of the following, Matt, that we are not physically capable of comprehending essentially anything. So when it comes to like the ultimate level of, of basically anything, sort of the, the meta of anything at all, um, our understanding will always be uh, massively paltry because of how limited it, it is. Um, so so to, to give you an example here, uh, you know, monkeys have a pretty good understanding of bananas, like in a functional sense, right? Like they know how to peel them and they know how to eat them and I don't know, maybe do other stuff with them, throw them, I, I have no idea. Um, but like they, they probably feel like they've mastered the banana. Uh, but you know, you, you go up a 3% genetic difference to humanity and, and now we start to understand the proteins, right? We understand the growth of the banana. We understand how to evolve it into different kinds of fruit. Uh, we understand vastly more. Now, you go up another 3% genetic difference, and maybe it's not genetic. Maybe it's neurotech and cognitive enhancements. Maybe it's just strong AI doing its own thing. Who knows? But you go up another 3%, and all of a sudden, whatever our grasp of the banana is, is, is gobbledygook. Uh, it's uh, legitimate gobbledygook. 
Um, and so can we understand consciousness? Yeah, to, to the degree of gobbledygook. Um, but it might be a pragmatic level of understanding that would at least let us birth whatever's next um, or, or give us maybe a functional understanding that could at least let us do something. So I, I'm not a uh, pessimist that there's no value in our knowledge, but, but I, I am uh, very cold about um, whatever the peak of our knowledge being uh, paltry in, in, the grand, in the grand scale of things. So um, about consciousness, I'm not sure if we can understand it. We haven't yet. Um, I suspect that uh, in the coming 15 years, just as we are seeing these robust uh, emphasis of venture capital into artificial intelligence, we will see a similarly robust emphasis into neurotech. We will see companies emerge. We will see national plans because the consequences of upgrading people are, are, are big deal stuff. Um, I think there's going to have to be global uh, transparency and, and um, steering around these technologies or basically war occurs. Um, but, but I think that we will see big confluences of private and public sector investment and that that um, coupled with sort of a lot more flourishing academic interest in the space will hopefully sort of chisel us down to better theories, better ways of testing them. Uh, maybe that'll get us nowhere, uh, but I am of the belief that it's somewhat inevitable that in the next 15 years, uh, we'll see a tag along to this big venture capital and interest pump into AI. We'll see a follow along in, in, in neuro, maybe not as big, uh, but we will see one. And I think consciousness will be part of that train. It'll get pulled along. Uh, my fingers are crossed, Matt, that that will bring progress in our understanding of it. You brought up brain machine interfaces. You brought up cyborgs merging. Do you think that humanity will be able to, if we do have implants and in implementations, be able to keep up with something like automation and AI? Uh, yeah, I mean, it depends on what, what way we mean keeping up. I think it's a good question. Um, so, uh, you know, the Kurzweil sort of grand poobah here, I forget if it's the singularity is near or how to build a mind, but his, his general theory is that um, there will be some merger of the biological and the non-biological, um, but that ultimately at some point, the non-biological part will be the important part. It will house most of and enable most of and allow for most of what is meaningful, useful, et cetera. Um, and, and that ultimately biological just won't be able to keep up capability wise, uh, understanding wise, creativity wise, um, expansiveness wise uh, as the non-biological. So Will we, will we keep up? I, I think it'll give us a little bit of a leg. It'll be another baton that we can hand off being a little bit more than just kind of hairless apes. Um, but I, I don't know if it lets us keep up with, uh, hypothetically, very grand sort of strong AI um, that, that might not be limited to our form factor. I, I, think, I think it can open up and maybe enable a tremendous amount more than we can currently imagine. And I mean that literally. People say more than we can imagine, and I think they mean that uh, sort of in, in the uh, kind of colloquial sense. It, it's, it's like, they don't mean it literally, but I mean more than we can imagine, literally. Senses, um, ideas that we just can't possibly hold, just like your dog can't understand Marxism. There's ideas that we can't understand. Just like, you know, a naked mole rat with no eyes or something can't understand light, um, you and I can't understand other kinds of senses. So I think it'll get us another good leg, right? It'll, it'll open up the qualia catalog. It'll open up the sentient space for us a little bit. But is it going to allow us to keep up with a hypothetical real deal AGI? Pro probably not. Um, but, you know, maybe it'll be more fun for that last 10 years. Um, so should we develop it at all? Uh, even cognitive enhancements? Or AGI? Yeah. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, do you have more there? Just in general. If you know that it's like sending the kid into the, the sword shop and having him to build his own sword knowing he's going to fall on it. Do you yeah. do that? Yeah. Um, well, depends on what's your goal. What's your goal? What's yours? Yeah, I, I don't know if I have one. I, I, my goal right now is the following, and I'm, I'm staunch on this, at least, at least at present. At some point, I might change. I'm staunch on the goal, the preeminent goal being, hey, humanity, what's after us? And how are we going to kind of uh, arrive thereof? What are the constellations of possible that we would consider preferable for us hairless apes? Um, like in terms of the trajectory of intelligence, whatever's going to populate the galaxy, what are going to be the maybe good ways? What are going to be the maybe good futures that we want to shoot towards, given the expanse of, of intelligence itself? What, what are those? And how do we get there without Armageddon? Um, so only real deal goal that I have right now is uh, encouraging that conversation. Um, there are goals that will arrive from that conversation, Matt, 
make no bones about it, brother. Make absolutely no bones about it. And in my belief, um, it will be within our lifetimes that, that uh, factions will arise in terms of what that answer should be. Some people will hard line be of the, the, the belief that humans as they are a billion years from now should still be the preeminent unit of moral value and should never be tinkered with in a playing God kind of sense. Um, and then other folks will say, we should birth the super intelligent super bliss, which a sugar cube of it would be worth more in a utilitarian scale than, you know, a uh, hundred people. Uh, and let's fill the universe with those sugar cubes and uh, have it understand the universe and, and fill it with bliss. Um, so you're going to have folks on both poles and you're going to have a lot of uh, bands in between. Um, but for right now, my goal is, hey, humanity, uh, the trajectory of intelligence is occurring. Uh, ought to figure out those constellations that don't suck and ought to figure out the ones that suck and then ought to figure out how to arrive at the non-sucky ones uh, without war. Um, and so, so that's my goal. There's one big assumption there and that's with intelligence comes consciousness. And the only thing that could be worse would be to create intelligence without consciousness. Yeah, yeah. Then you're taking away the good and you're kind of just building the bad yeah, and yeah. You tell what you've done. Yep. So, well, great point. I, by the way, I have never, and you, you will not read it in any post from the last eight years, my good man, nor will you see it on any of my recorded TED Talks or anywhere. Never once have I conflated the expanse of the intelligence, the capability of AI, with an expanse of consciousness necessarily. I think that those are probably very different nuts to crack. Now, there's different theories, right? Kurzweil is of the belief that of a certain degree of complexity in terms of a mind of sorts, um, consciousness arises and, and that right now we can't maybe measure that, but that it does. Um, I don't know if I'm of that belief. There's a lot of other models of consciousness and I think anybody with any semblance of certainty, and I don't, I'm not saying Kurzweil does, I'm not hating on the man. I think any semblance of certainty around your model of consciousness is exclusively in the realm of, of idiots. So I think if you, if you are certain about what consciousness is, um, you're, you're necessarily uh, an idiot um, because we don't know. Uh, and, and saying otherwise would, would make you an idiot. Um, and so uh, I don't know what consciousness is. And to be frank, it may only ever exist in you know, carbon as we see it now. Uh, there are people who theorize that. Uh, so to, to your point, I think that if we knew it couldn't be replicated, that would alter our goals, wouldn't it? When we ask ourselves, what are the preferable constellations? Should we only be building dead metal? I think that Maybe some of those constellations are less preferable. Should that be very much alive metal, my good man, then I think those constellations might be preferable. There's one issue. I can't even prove that you're conscious. Mm. So when we Brother, create- I'm, I'm, I'm solipsistic to the death, my pal. I, I have never escaped Hume's fork. I have never escaped Hume's fork. There are things that are true in and of themselves. Triangle has three sides, and then there's perception. As far as I'm concerned, all of this could have been Descartes' demon dancing senses in front of my face since the day I was born. Uh, so the simulation argument has never bothered me because I've never really believed in base reality in the first place. Um, so yeah, that's a real problem. And that's I don't not, know. That's that. not even the simulation argument though. So. Oh no, it's not. It's not. It's deeper. It's farther. It's. It, I mean, everything, everything could be robots. Everything could be something else. But what I mean is what happens when we create robots that seem to be intelligent? We have an, we have an aspect with, with animals, with other creatures of giving them human like traits, whether or not they actually have those, whether, the dog's licking your hand because he loves you or he's licking yeah, your hand yeah, because yeah. He just, you just fed him. Well, what happens with robots and with AI when we're not able to tell whether or not they're conscious? Can we keep them as slaves if we think they might be conscious? And if we don't think they're conscious and then find out they are, the economy crashes. And then people, people it's, it's, the, it's the problem of robots that are too similar. I can't think of the, the term right now. Anthropomorphic. When, um, yeah, you're, but, you're asking if, if we make them anthropomorphic, if... Uh, but we'll anthropomorphize them e either way. People kind of feel bad when the, ro the Roomba runs into the wall. It's funny. Uh, so you, you're asking essentially if they are conscious or they're not, will that change our relations with them? Will it still be okay to have them clean the dishes or whatever? Is this where you're going? How, how do we relate to them when we don't know? Yeah. Because um, we'll never know. Yeah, I think... Now, again, I think a lot of Kurzweil's ideas here are good. I, I'm, I'm not a fanboy formally, uh, but in this regard, I think the idea is pretty strong. His idea in general is that if you're, if you're having an indistinguishable kind of conversation and relating in a way whereby it, it hits on all of our points, right? It, 
and maybe the facial expressions and the, the intonation and um, the kinds of uh, content that's being exchanged. Uh, if, if that, beyond a certain level of feel, if that feels real, like we're, we're going to more or less treat them that way either way. Um, and that there may be some people who are like, well, I know it's not really conscious, so uh, I, I won't treat it, um, I won't treat it as well. Uh, I, I think most people will probably default to somewhat human-like interactions if human-like is being modeled almost indistinguishably. Um, that's my guess. Could be wrong about that, though. Um, I would agree, but then we build deities that we don't even know if they're conscious or not, and then they take over and kill us, yeah, and we're all totally I, fine with that. I'm not going to lie. Uh, well, not everybody will be fine. Again, I, I really, I'm of the belief that um, setting the ultimate goal right now, so a singular North Star, is not the current human priority. I think the current human priority is determine the constellations and bar ourselves from arms races and war. Um, and then we can go about finding kind of final North Stars and, and shooting hard. But um, and not that that will ever end. I'm just saying uh, I think that, that finding and seeking will, will always occur. Um, but uh, I, um, yeah, I think that we really ought to be taking cracks at consciousness. I mean, we, we really ought to be figuring out the ball game there. We really ought to be figuring that out. Is it as Emerson supposes in the Eastern sense that we're all just holes poked in the same great canvas and there's some big connected consciousness going on somewhere? Uh, is it that consciousness arises from complexity of little interacting stuff? Uh, you know, is it from something specific to neurons? I mean, I, I think that figuring that out, so uh, right now, until I get a better theory, things that are self-aware are morally relevant, things that are not self-aware are not. Um, if that's the case, and we're building the trajectory of intelligence, I think that reckless expansion of the trajectory of intelligence without an understanding of consciousness is absolutely the wrong order of affairs. It's absolutely the wrong order of affairs. Now, we may have to do it. We may run up against so many brick walls on consciousness that we just need more frickin' brain power to crack it. But if we start setting off the trajectory without understanding consciousness or not consciousness, we're going about it the wrong way. So I'm very much hoping that that confluence of funding that I told you about um, will occur in the next 15 years um, and that we'll make some firm progress as to what is and isn't conscious. Uh, but there is a nightmare, Matt, as you articulated, uh, where we don't figure that out to our own detriment. Speaking of where we're headed, jobs automation AI thoughts. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm not, I'm not a sky is falling guy here. I'm not on the, you know, hey, in 10 years, no one's going to be able to work. But I think that there is a lot of credence to the idea that um, the concentration of wealth, if I were a betting man, uh, I would bet that by natural forces that would that would continue pretty well and that the this idea of the unemployable class um may in fact emerge uh maybe not to a world crushing degree but to a disturbing degree uh over the next you know decade and a half two decades um uh i think you could argue we're seeing some of that here in the first world with you know, say middle america the rust belt and whatnot um uh, but I, I do think that um, I'm somewhat, so the, the answer is obviously to some degree is in education, to some degree is in building jobs that are multi-context and they're not easily automated. Um, but I'm, I'm somewhat pessimistic that sufficient training and sufficient, honestly, willingness to continually learn can realistically be fostered by the bulk of the populace. Um, because I think that's really hard. I think it's not everybody's priority. I think that my grandmother had like one big technological hurdle, which was like learn to use a typewriter. And like before then it was like, I don't know, writing with whatever she was writing with. Uh, you and me got to learn a new software every two months. Um, Lord knows what it's going to be in six years. So I, I'm pessimistic that the keep up rate there is really going to expand to as much of humanity uh, as, as are working at present. So I'm hoping for a gradual shift, Matt. Um, uh, and so I don't think the sky is falling. I'm hoping for a gradual shift, but I think there's some uncrackable nuts that seem to be shifting in the direction of, yeah, less people able to make a bunch of money with, with great jobs. Um, how do we economically keep things going? Oh man. I mean, uh, so I will be frank with you. I think that my 
areas of expertise certainly are not crystal balling the future. I have very little of that. Um, uh, and certainly is not in, in uh, economics formally, you know, uh, studying Milton Friedland or whatever the case may be, right? I, I, I'm out of, my, uh, out of my domain there. Um, but, you know, in terms of the stuff I do know pretty well, which is the, the realistic impact of AI on different sectors, life sciences, defense, uh, everything financial services, everything manufacturing, everything retail. Um, I think... Um, you know, that there's, there's hypotheses around some degree of uh, universal basic income, which I, you know, if I, again, if I was a betting man, I would say in the next 15 years, we'll have a lot more experiments with. Um, but other than that, I don't, I don't have, I don't have awesome answers. You know, I, I think um, tinkering with an economy, particularly an international economy, or we're dealing with different markets around the world that are more or less developed, uh, I think, I think is, is a, its own challenge. You got to get a PhD in that. And, and even if you get 50 PhDs to talk about what the U.S. should do about the economy, <clears throat> drastically different answers from each one of them. Um, so my hope would only be the following, that we can at least map somehow globally, maybe the World Bank could do this, maybe the OECD could do this. I'm, I'm speaking for the OECD in a couple months. I'm going to try to cajole them a little bit. Um, they should keep a, a pulse, a map of the job and economic impact of different technologies globally as much as they can. So that if we start to see a real effect on, let's say, the developing world manufacturing in electronics, for example, in Malaysia and in other areas of Asia, we might be able to warn or prepare, let's say, South America for similar things. Um, same kind of thing in the first world, same kind of things elsewhere. I think that as good as we could do is have some transparency on where is this stuff shaken up and how can a global community in terms of regulation or, or business um, mitigate some of the, the big pops that are going to hit some of these sectors. Um, which pops are going to come first? By golly, Matt, that's a tough question to ask. Um, but I, I hope we can pulse it well enough to brace for those impacts. So does that mean we have to keep jobs even if we can have robots make everything? Oh, I don't believe so. I think, uh, I think that's a stupid, uh, stupid idea. Um, however, I will say that I think to ask the majority of humanity to invent what meaning is outside of have kids and go to a job Bro, you're looking at a tall order, my chap. You're looking at a real tall order. You're looking at a real tall order, my chap. Uh, so where does that leave us? I don't know. I think eventually, uh, should we all have universal basic income and have our 3D printers that print whatever we want and have our virtual realities that produce whatever we want, um, we'll still be miserable so long as we still have the same hardware software, just like me and you here in the first world. We are in a world rife with depression, my brother, rife with suicide, my brother, rife, I tell you. And so given the same hardware and software, given the flawed vessel in which we operate, um, we'll still be miserable apes. Um, and eventually, so here's a prediction, um, uh, no certainty here, here's a prediction. Eventually, after universal basic income, the 3D printer, the VR, all that stuff, full immersion in what we want, the hedonic treadmill will continue, we'll still be miserable on the aggregate. Um, or somewhat miserable. I'm being a little bit pessimistic, but you know what I mean. Like suicide, still a big deal. Depression, still a big deal. Uh, no matter how much 3D printer, VR, no worky stuff uh, we have. Eventually, people ask for universal basic happiness. Pharmacological means, neurological means, nanotechnological means, doesn't matter. People will essentially ask the government, not for, not for money. They will ask for well-being in and of itself because nothing matters outside of that and nothing has ever mattered outside of that for man such as Aristotle's core theory of why we all act for our own happiness. Eventually people, so right now, Matt, we're all so dumb, Matt, we're so dumb that we all suspect that once we grasp X or Y, certainly our, our aggregate well-being will lift. But of course that's not the case. Of course that's not the case. And eventually there will be enough precedence of well-being enhancement that people will turn their eye to it and they will say, it, what I have always wanted, it is actually within my grasp and they will just ask for well-being itself. Most people, Matt, if we make it there technologically, okay, you give us nukes, you give us climate catastrophe, I don't know if this is going to happen, but if we make it there, if universal basic income is sort of a most people don't work situation goes down, most people are going to want to eat the lotus, brother. They will want to eat the lotus. And I essentially promise you this. Um, if we make it, if we make it. And then an unemployment benefits, basically, you get IV'd into... VR, Bop. you have a, you have a sugar drop. Straight to the dome, my friend. Nobody mm -hmm. wants anything else. 
Yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting and terrifying and a potential for me paradox solution in and of itself. What are, yeah. the, what are the big problems that you think about on a day-to-day basis? Yeah, I mean, uh, so uh, ultimately it's on a day-to-day basis, uh, um, a lot of my work is focused on pulsing the now. Number one, because um, this gives me cool ideas about the future when I can see really where AI is making traction in all these different fields. So I, I do think a lot about the now. However, the, the big stuff that, that kind of, I guess, bugs me that I feel like I'm chipping away on um, are, are kind of two things. So one of them is this global um, conversation facilitation that I spoke to you about, where I really believe that right now I don't have a post-human goal that's ironclad. The only goal that I have is the discernment of constellations of preferable, uh, gl- like globally across languages and whatnot, constellations of preferable Uh, trajectories for intelligence and and futures for humanity and constellations of non-preferable trajectories for humanity. I don't think there's ever going to be awesome agreement on that. Mm, That's unfortunate, but some, at least there's probably some sand traps we can really flesh out. Um, And then figuring out how to get countries on a same page to uh, potentially sort of pursue those mutually beneficial uh, end end games or waypoints um, without arms races and conflict. I don't have awesome answers there and it occupies a tremendous amount of my, my thinking. Um, but that is, that is what I'd love to encourage. So that's, that's one of them. We can dive into that. Um, I can give you the other one as well. Yeah. AI is a winner take all arms race. How do you put guide rails on that? Oh, I don't really think you do. Um, I'd like, I'd like to, you know, I think I'm really kind of haunted by, um, uh, the last words of, of Alexander the Great. Um, and I, I think about this a lot. I wrote an essay called The Last Words of Alexander. Um, and I wonder if this is how it always goes. Uh, when he was dying, it's purported by Plutarch that um, he was essentially asked right upon death, sort of, uh, king, to whom will we give the kingdom? And that he, he said, to the strongest, and then died. Um, and the question, I think, is, is that who the kingdom always goes to, right? Do we, do we try to make it be otherwise, but it, it, it's just how it is, you know? Um, and that's unfortunate because we'd like to think that these, there can be some floating virtues and uh, solidarity that can kind of overcome all of that, but shucks. Um, what if the advantages of, of being strong, what if, what if the best way to be safe is to be strong? Um, and, and what if there's, there's really no way around that, you know? Uh, I think mutually assured destruction is a nice deterrent. Uh, I think hopefully we'll find some others. Um, I have a lot more brainstorming and thinking and interviewing to do in this domain, but you're right. I mean, there's a lot of winner takes all benefits. And if you can own military might and uh, economic might and whatnot, and technological progress, by golly, you know, your country, your empire, whatever it is. I mean, it's, it's a tough, it's tough to argue against that if you could strike at it, you know, um, it incentivizes you to go too fast and possibly make mistakes as well. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. You're right about that. And, and it incentivizes the arms race dynamic that I think uh, between the U S and China is essentially inevitable. India may step up into the game in the next 15 years. They may become kind of a player in this world, but for right now it, it's really the U S and China. Um, I don't want to make it adversarial. I don't sit here and wish for it, but there's an inevitability to it. There's a kind of Thucydides trap going on. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, a tough, it's a tough situation. I also think that China's political arrangement makes it even tougher, you know? Um, now, we've got plenty of problems here in the States. I mean, jeepers, you know, Donald Trump's the president of the U.S. Um, but, uh, man, the guy can't assassinate anybody who runs against him, you know? And as far as I know, um, he, you know, he, uh, he's going to be out of here. You know, if, if eight years is going to be the cap, right? There's no emperors for life. There's no old school... Chinese, uh, um, uh, you know, kind of rulership dynamics going on. I think that I think that that sort of makes um, collaboration all, all the harder, uh, all the harder. There's kind of the, the theory that democracies rarely go to war. Well, by golly, China ain't one of them, uh, and uh, I think that that gives us some more uphill stuff to to deal with. Well, also, China can think more long term. Oh yeah, there's benefits. I mean, I've written about this at effing length, my friend. Length. Uh, there, there's, if I was, if you, you put me in any seat to kind of get the AGI off the ground, 
you want to be in G suite, man. That, that's where you want to be, brother. I mean, you want a compliant people built on Confucian values where everybody looks up to the emperor, right? You don't want any of that crazy Western crap where they're against tyranny. You know, you, you, want, you want that alignment to the emperor, right? You want the noble emperor to whom everybody follows. You want to be able to create Mao Zedong thought. You want to be able to create Xi Jinping thought, which, which is taught in schools. I don't know if he has little books printed, but he's at least got his thought. Uh, and that's acceptable. That's viable. That's possible. Uh, you, you want that degree of compliance. You want an economy that's on the way up. And of course, they're slowing, but they're on the way up more than the U.S. as far as I know still, though I'm sure they have plenty of shakiness. I'm not an economist. Um, and uh, and you, yeah, you, you want that degree of compliance. And you also want that degree of wielding force, right? You want to be able to take academia, take the private sector, and take everything in the government and wield it all to your aims as the ruler, right? The, the, the ruler. I mean, let's not call it something more politically correct. Like, let's just call it a ruler. Like, if you can kill people, and if you can take any school or any business and make them be an arm, an, an extension of your will, by golly, man, I mean, that, that's the place to be, man. That's the place to be. I mean, he's, he's got a good, he's got a real good. And you don't uh, have to get reelected. You just talked to somebody about China's AI, um, AI education system, didn't you? Yeah, yeah. We interviewed a fellow from Carnegie Mellon, uh, David Turetsky, who's working on essentially studying the efforts that different countries are making to um, build uh, sort of artificial intelligence into their earlier schooling curricula. And China has some plans and progress there, um, kind of that they're getting off the ground. And David is of the belief that America should be doing the same. Um, and it was a pretty interesting conversation. But yeah, there's, there's a lot of efforts there. Uh, if she gets really hot to trot on AI, he can, and he is, obviously, uh, he can really run that initiative and, and run that train hard. And, uh, you know, any U.S. president could just have the opposite party elected a couple years later and just fry it all. Um, so, well, not only know. that, they're not even incentivized to think longer term. They're incentivized to think on the yes. short term. Yes, yes. And, and, you know, what the Winston Churchill quote about democracy, right? I mean, I'll, I, I'm not inventing anything new by criticizing it the way he did. I mean, it's, it's all I got. So, yeah, there's advantages. Again, if you could be anybody right now, uh, should you want to direct the trajectory, you'd be Xi Jinping, man. That's the place to be. You want to, you want to, anybody that comes up against you, you want to kill them. You want to end their life. And um, you want to take any entity within arm's reach, within your nation's borders, and just wield them. Wield any entity within your nation's borders as, as, an, as an arm, as a muscly arm of your will. Um, God, there's nothing better than that. If, if, should, should you want like tyrannical power? I mean, it's a place to be. Confucian values, oh my God. It's like, it's the best. It's like, they're molded. It's like, it's so good. Um, it's so good. So good. What do you think about some of the other implications of AI, where we're going with driverless cars, where we're going with a lot of other industries? Oh man, we'd have to pick one, dude. <laughs> I, I can go, I can go in a lot of directions with you uh, about, about AI. You just want to talk about like the impact of AI on different industries, Matt? Like what's the most exciting and what's the most immediate? <sighs> yeah, cool. Um, so immediate are spaces that are, uh, and for some reason, this is neither known nor talked about, which is, in my opinion, somewhat ridiculous. Um, where it's most immediate are in digital native sectors. So I'll give you a fistful of digital native sectors, okay? Uh, E-commerce, online media, fintech. It's just a fistful, but it's a pretty predominant fistful. Um, these are spaces where companies were built for the internet. They were built with an understanding of data infrastructure. Many of them built with some sense of, uh, of where AI would fit into the business model itself, where you take manufacturing, you take oil and gas, you take banking. There was no infrastructure for building and training algorithms for what we call kind of the, the data dominance cycle of really owning all the data within a sector, producing a product that's so much better that you can completely monopolize. Really the, the flywheel of, of, of um, competitive moat that AI creates, which is its own topic, which I won't bore you with, but we've written about at length in every damn industry you can imagine at Emerge. Um, uh, and that, that's what we're paid for. Um, uh, that was not baked into a lot of these, these, these earlier spaces. And so you take these businesses where everybody's digitally native, data infrastructure is understood really well, and AI is just wieldable, right? It's, it's understandable within all the different teams. Um, all the data is in digital form. So if, if I work in online media, Matt, okay, I, or let's say e-commerce, Amazon, right? Um, let's say I want to train algorithms on who buys what and what to recommend to people and all that stuff, okay? 
Uh, let's compare that to Target. Now, Target has physical stores. Now, they do e-commerce as well, but they have physical stores. How much harder is it to track what Susan, Susan with her little shopping cart, puts in and takes out of her cart and what she buys and all that stuff? What if she buys some cash, right? We don't know who the users are. We don't know their time on page. We don't know what they added or took out of cart. We don't know any of that. In, in Amazon land, everything is in a ledger. And so the data is, is, is right there. And so these, these virtual ecosystem, digitally native sectors are the ones that are tearing it up with AI for patently obvious reasons. And for some reason, people are wondering like, oh, will, will automotive be where it takes off? It's like, no, it's already taken off and it, it's in the digitally native sector. So everybody is looking to them with reverence. Every bank hopes to poach the people from Amazon. Every bank in China hopes to poach the people from Tencent and Baidu and Alibaba. Um, so that's where it's taking off. Um, we could uh, go into that farther, but that's, that's the, there's no scare you that all the talents there, Google, Amazon, Facebook, yeah. we own all the talent. Mm. It's not all the talent, but it is still really bothersome, right? If I go down to Atlanta and I'm, you know, speaking at Georgia tech or I go to, um, you know, here in Boston and I, I don't know, hang out at the uh, Cambridge innovation center at MIT. Um, it is bothersome how many graduates are going to predictably go to Mountain View. Like it, it's weird, you know, it, it really is weird. Um, uh, particularly like the really, really sharp ones. Um, so does it bother me? Uh, does it scare I, you? Yeah. Does it scare me? I mean, I'm of two minds on this and I don't understand like most things. I don't understand the ramifications far enough ahead. Uh, it is pretty clear, and I think things are starting to uh, get on a railroad for in this direction, that our definition of monopoly has to shift. Because um, it's not what it used to be. It's not, it's not Vanderbilt, Rockefeller. Now, you got to give it to those guys. I mean, those guys were doing stuff. Um, and we had to make up rules for them. So, like, uh, the rules we set up there, I think they have pretty good rules, I think. I, I don't know. Maybe there's better monopoly rules in Europe. I have no idea. Um, but there's, there's new kinds of monopoly enabled by data and enabled by uh, very narrow kind of specific skill sets. Um, I'm not calling Google or Facebook bad, uh, but I am saying that they are very much magnetizing more and more of, of those new factors of monopolistic ultimate um, kind of power. Clearly, these are companies that wield more influence than nations. Uh, it's sort of obvious. And um, like most nations. Um, and... Uh, does that bother me? Maybe. Uh, I don't know the impact X years ahead of us going in and breaking those companies up versus us not going in and breaking those, those up. Um, my, my biggest hesitation is that should we go in and create all these new barriers to becoming swellingly powerful with AI here in the West, right, where um, we, we set these rules, we vote in these rules, and, and um, uh, we, we determine all these ways to kind of limit and hedge the power of our uh, private sector entities. My supposition is that in China, um, there, will be a, there will be less of an emphasis on sort of making them less powerful uh, because it's not that bad if they're powerful, um, so long as they don't have a horrible internal economic impact. It's not that bad if they're powerful because then... China can wield them, right? If they're super, if Baidu becomes astronomically more capable than Google, let's say Google gets broken up, pop, seven different Googles, okay? Um, Baidu is now probably a bigger deal than those companies. Um, that's really awesome if your name is, is Xi Jinping. Uh, it's, just, it's, just, it's really good, right? It's good, it's good stuff, man. You know, it's good. Uh, so uh, I'm wary of weakening an international competitive dynamic position for the sake of our own kind of wealth sharing considerations or uh, privacy, I, I don't know. I'm not saying those things are not important. In fact, I think they're extremely important. But I think that there is, there is a version of the future of the West, okay? There's a version. There's a version of the future of the West where we presume everything's always gonna be cool. We're always gonna be sitting on top internationally in terms of culture, right? We take for granted that they watch, you know, U.S. movies in Bangalore and stuff like that, right? We take it all for granted. Our passports get us in anywhere. It's all for granted. We take, you know, gay rights. It's all for granted. Um, so uh, there's a version of, of the future of the West where we really chip away at all of our strengths in the name of different values and virtues, which are all good values and virtues, but we chip away at, at what makes us internationally strong and prominent. 
to the point whereby we're no longer internationally strong and prominent. And then other cultures that are stronger have a bigger cultural influence uh, on, on us and, and, and that we're just weakened altogether. And so the breakup of these bigger companies, I haven't, I haven't figured out how it would go both ways. I haven't had enough conversations to sort it out. But I think there is some hesitation about hampering and crippling ourselves internationally, given the fact that um, our competitors ain't probably going to be doing the same thing. Um, so yeah, those are concerns. On the flip side, do you want to win the fight where you have to compromise your morals and become the enemy anyways? A hundred percent. Yeah. I think that these, well, uh, those are real, those are real concerns. Those are real concerns. Um, those are real concerns. I have no, I have no answers there. I, again, like I said, I, I really feel like I've got to have more conversations about the pros and cons of our self hampering in, in, in the name of certain values. Um, and if we stretch that out to the international sphere, where does that put us relatively? And do those benefits of these values being enabled um, actually really come back and pound us in an international way that, that uh, would be much more detrimental uh, than having Google, than having Sergey Brin be worth $40 billion, you know, just, just much more detrimental than that. Um, so I'm not sure. Uh, you bring up a good question. There's clearly a point whereby we probably don't want to cross it. Um, I don't think that, that, that is fleshed out enough for me to have a firm answer there. It's very hard. The problem is it will never be fleshed out enough for a firm answer. Of course, of course. But I mean, I haven't even had enough conversations on both sides of that fence to feel like I could lick my finger, put it in the air and just point you in one direction or the other. Like I, I can't even pick either one. I, um, I just think that both probably have valid arguments as you brought up. I would agree. I think we position China too much as an enemy. When you, yeah. when you think, think about something like that, you end up creating something like that. I think it's the CCP. I actually have never really considered it to be China, right? It's like, oh, China, the nation. <laughs> it's like, oh, the, the soil itself ekes up bad guy points. It's like, no, not, not really. I think Mao Zedong ekes up bad guy points. Um, not that Trump ekes up good guy points, right? That's not what I'm saying. Um, but I'm saying that the power structures uh, and the compliance to those power structures is a threat. I, I've never said it's like, it's China, it's Chinese people. No, it's the CCP. Um, so that's, that's where I stand on it. Um, I'd like to frame it not as an enemy or rivalry dynamic. I don't know how else to. I don't think it's China. It's far from Chinese people. Uh, it is the CCP, though. Um, as I'm sure many people see the American government with our military bases all over the freaking world and Lord knows what else. Uh, for, mo as, for most as, people, yeah. they're synonymous, though. I, for me, it kind of feels like there's a big kid on the playground, and I'm thinking, hmm, you know what? Did he just look at me? And of course, he didn't look at me. But I'm kind of going over there, and I'm giving him like the look, and I'm trying to I'm trying to egg him into a fight because you know what? I think I, that's kind of what it feels like when you look from oh, the outside. I think there's some of that. I mean, there is there are realistic concerns, right? Like you're you're aware of the Uyghur situation, I'm sure. Um, yeah, but that's the Uyghur situation is very different than a we go to war with China. Because very different. China might. Yeah. Very uh, over, different. Yeah. But very different. Um, but I think that uh, the 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 dynamics writ large. Um, the, the, the degree of fluent discourse writ large, I think, as far as I'm concerned, the two biggest barriers, um, and I'd love to have more conversations to flesh this out, I think language is a huge one. China is a great example of a country where they can really get by without English, right? Of course, Europe can't do that, not in tech anyway. Um, you know, South America can't do that, not in tech anyway, not in, not in tech anyway, okay? If you, you run drug stores, I'm sure you can just speak Spanish and you're kosher, but, but they ain't doing that in tech. Um, but in China, you know, all the really powerful, exciting businesses in all the most exciting fields can, can kind of not have to really rely on English necessarily. Um, and so language, like just the, the ability to kind of have that open discourse, I think is barred from a lot of that. And I'm not blaming China or the U S on that. I'm saying that's a logistical factor. The other thing I think is just democracies don't go to war, um, or, or rarely. Right. And I think that, um, there, there are real, there's real stuff that you could do in Xi Jinping's situation. I, I imagine there's real stuff you could do with Trump as well, but um, it's very clear who has a more firm grasp on power. Um, and I think that uh, 
the ability to sort of mold the populace, right? To, to, to do the brainwashing game in a very overt, unabashed sense with the Uyghurs, but that's the tip of the iceberg. I mean, you know, if Xi Jinping thought and, and um, what will eventually happen in virtual reality, uh, from what I suspect, um, I, I think there's real considerations with sort of that power structure being accepted and normal um, in terms of facilitating international discourse and peace. Um, eh, that's a supposition. Could be proved wrong. Maybe it's just smelling the big kid on the block, but I, I think there's actually some, some real nice tangible stuff in there uh, when you got uh, tyrannic power. Um, it's just a guess. I would agree. I think the democracy thing is a little bit kind of cheating, though. We, a, we haven't had democracy for very long. B, when a democracy becomes a dictator, it's because someone gets elected in and they decide to become more powerful. Become we, can one, kind, yeah. we can kind of twist it. And then almost all of the wars that we've had are, oh, there's communism. Let's go fight them. So it, it kind of it kind of complicates it. Oh but yeah, the, well I wouldn't say I wouldn't say oh Chinese are still doing this communism. Let's go fight them. Right? That that's not a motive. No, I, I mean I, I, I meant I meant Cold War. Like I meant like oh, all yeah, the yeah, yeah. wars sure, that happened. Sure. It, I, I was I'm not I'm not I'm neither um, I'm neither uh, encouraging that or or like saying that I support all of that. Nor am I necessarily saying to do the same thing now. I just think that um, logistically. Uh, uh, I mean, for, for all I know, um, you're right. Hey, democracy's new. That's why there haven't been that many wars. End of story, right? Um, for all I know, the statistical analysis would really shoot that argument down. Um, I didn't go to grad school for that, unfortunately. So uh, I don't have a firm enough statement outside of just hearing what other people have said. So you may be right. You may be right there. You may be right. I'm just playing devil's advocate. Let's jump to uh, the lightning round. Sound good? Okay, cool. Yeah, let's do it. Guys, this is our patron-only bonus. If you subscribe at a level of $5 or more per month at disruptors.fm slash Patreon, you unlock these and some bonus episodes as well and help keep this sustainable. You ready to do it? I'm ready, man. Let's dive in. Speech recognition translation. How close are we to nailing it? I actually think we're doing pretty well. Um, now, I haven't used Skype's real-time translation. I haven't seen like the latest demos. It's from, um, if it's from Microsoft, I would be a little hesitant. Every time they update Skype, it breaks. I know, I know. Oh, man, I, I, I have plenty of frustrations with Skype. I, I still run like a, a large number of our podcasts on Skype, and I, uh, I, I, I have all of those woes. Um, but, but yeah, they were doing pretty well. Um, if I'm not mistaken, I don't know if it was real-time translation, but Baidu is doing some out-of-this-world stuff in terms of, of uh, transcribing audio and translating audio. Um, they were doing some really, really powerful stuff. I was in their, um, their AI lab in Silicon Valley a couple of years ago. Uh, and since then, they've ramped it up astronomically far. So, you know, I'm not going to lie. Something like Mandarin to English, where there's huge AI communities on both sides of the fence, you, know, you take some really obscure language like, I don't know. The, in India, there's like a bajillion languages, right? And, and you, you have Hindi, where there's a, a pretty good number of people that speak it in English in, in India. But then you have like, um, you know, you have Urdu and, and, and Kannada and you have uh, Tamil and you have all these other languages. And some of those, I think it's going to be tough for them to chip through because we might not have a lot of people working on those languages specifically. But if we look at like English to French or um, uh, English to, to, to Mandarin, which is really hard, but there's so many people on both sides of the fence uh, that, it, that it's, it's pretty powerful. I, I would suspect maybe in 18 months, two years, we might already have somewhat functional conversational translation in real time, but I would guess we'll, we'll be at a point where hypothetically, should I have access to that software, who knows if it'll be free or paid or whatever, um, I'd be able to ring up, uh, you know, Beijing and chat with somebody about whatever um, and, and have a pretty, a pretty okay uh, version of it. Maybe it would take five years to the point where it's like real nice you know, where we have gradients of confidence about everything that's translated, we can see if it's red or green, and we can get a sense of, should I take that statement seriously? Or was it a low gradient of confidence? I think at some point, we'll be able to see all that in real time. But I would say 18 to two, 18 months, two years, um, I would hope we'd be able to have functional, uh, a functional degree. And I think that that would help to build the cosmopolitan spirit. Um, because I, I think when people just talk to other humans, I think it's really, really hard not to just see the bajillion things you have in common, and to understand how other people think. And that's the point of this podcast, to get the interesting people to have those conversations to inspire more. Thanks cool. for coming on today, Dan. I got two last questions. All right. Before you tell me where to find you, where people can find you. That's first one, quote or call to action. What would you want to leave people with? 
Oh man. God damn. Um, quote or call to action. I, I'd say, um, I mean, I, I guess I have no better advice. You had asked, uh, you know, what would you do if you were 18? And I, I think the Emerson response would be do what the heart appoints. Um, and so I, I have no real further calls to action other than doing what the heart appoints. I think if people hear enough ideas about grand possibilities of the good or bad on shows like this, um, hopefully their heart has the ability to appoint a great many things. And wherever that enthusiasm uh, swells, I would say, hit it, man. You know, who knows how long this uh, human existence is going to be as it is. So hit it. And one last one. You, ser- you clearly have some type of philosophy background. You've quoted Emerson, Plutarch, Montaigne. Yeah. What's the deal? What's the story? Um, I don't have a formal background in philosophy at all, but I, I did, uh, I, I got into philosophy when I was maybe 17 or 18 reading Aristotle, um, just kind of really stepping into the absurdity of the world and, and our condition uh, and deciding maybe I should see if people have thought about this stuff. Um, and so it started with the Greeks back then, and I kind of hung there for a long time. Um, and then Emerson was my gateway drug when I was about 23 or 24 to, um, uh, to mostly to Montaigne, to Plutarch, uh, to Francis Bacon, and to some other thinkers that have really, really been important in my life. So the Greeks were a, a big part of my intellectual development, trying to strive towards a good life and understanding models of virtue and whatnot. And, and uh, I just draw from that well. So no, no, no academic background, just reading, just books. Well, this has been a fun and interesting one. You're certainly a fun and interesting guy. If you can keep up with me on the, the cynicism side of things, but it's I'm, been a good one. Yeah, I'm down with it, brother. I'm down with it. Where can people find you and learn more? Yeah, uh, people can go to, if you're interested in what we do with artificial intelligence, kind of near-term impact and long-term stuff, uh, the website is emerj.com. So Emerge with a J. Uh, Emerge Artificial Intelligence Research is the name of the business. You can check us out there. We're on all social media. And then I'm just at Dan Fagella on Twitter. And I'm always conversing with people about crazy future stuff or you know reading art. That's like my, my feed of cool things to do. So when people want to connect with me, I always say, Dan Fagella on Twitter, find me there. Sweet. We'll have links and everything in the show notes, guys. Disruptors.fm. And if you guys enjoyed this episode, be sure to share it with a friend. That's the most effective thing you can do to help make this a bigger, more impactful movement. So thanks and cheers. Cool.